Hi, this is uh, Phil Newman. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Longevity Technology, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Michael Sidler, who is going to be joining me as one of the speakers at the October Rejuvenation Startup Summit uh, in Berlin. Uh, Dr. Sidler is a molecular biologist and investor from the VC firm Red Alpine, and uh, welcome, Michael. Uh, certainly a pleasure to be here and uh, thrilled to do the interview with you. Great. Well, um, Michael, let's let's jump right in and start talking about um, Red Alpine's uh, focus on longevity and uh, rejuvenation. Is this something that has been part of your thesis for a long time, or have you started moving into this space as, as others have started to be more interested in what's happening in the longevity sector? So yeah, before I, I go into the details of longevity, maybe uh, Red Alpine has been around as an investor since uh, 2006, and we are a European-wide early stage investor, classical VC. And uh, from on our beginning, we have been investing in uh, a wide area, wide, wide diversity of topics from tech to life science, like uh, consumer internet, uh, fintech stuff, but on the other hand, also biotech stuff, medical devices. And what we always were most interested in was the intersection of the two fields, like where data and tech overlaps with life science. And um, we have been looking at that stuff since the beginning of Red Alpine, probably that was before the, the term longevity was was um, popular. So we always have been looking at these kind of deals without really understanding that nowadays you would call that longevity. Um, so yes, we have been around looking at those deals, but now that the field of longevity and rejuvenation is, is um, becoming more popular and taking off, uh, certainly also we will increase our activities in that space. Oh, very good. So, uh, Michael, maybe you could give us an idea of some of the companies that uh, Red Alpine has invested in and, and what was your rationale on, on uh, supporting those companies? Yes, that probably depends quite a bit on the much debated definition of longevity. Um, but I can just give you a couple of examples. I mean, the, the way we define or I would define longevity on a very broad basis would be like you enable healthy people through interventions with their lives to expand either lifespan or health span. So that's that's how I would define it. So therefore I would we have a couple of investments in companies that are fighting cancer. I would not put that under longevity, even though if you can cure cancer that increases your lifespan quite clearly. I would look at as I said before, companies that have enabled healthy people to, to basically improve their lives. And uh, one of the companies we have in our portfolio, which is um, helping people to deal, for example, with blood pressure, is a company called Actia. Uh, by wearing their bracelet, you can continuously monitor your blood pressure and then also take according actions to manage your blood pressure in a, in a way such that basically eventually you can just manage your, your your blood pressure. There can be all kinds of lifestyle changes. It can, could be medication. Important, important thing is that you have your own continuous longitudinal data set that enables you to, to do that. Another company that we have um, funded actually with our first fund um, is a company uh, and, and we have already exited that company. It's a company called Biognosis. Um, they have a technology to measure and quantify an individual person's, indiv uh, yeah, individual person's proteome um, and uh, at affordable prices. I firmly believe as a molecular biologist that by measuring the proteome, you will be able to um, also, if you establish a longitudinal data set there, you will be able to uh, recognize all kinds of changes in your body because uh, everything converges in the proteome, like uh, your environmental stimuli, what you eat, but also your, your genes, everything converges. And if you can measure and track uh, individual proteins over over a long stretch of time, you will be able to give fantastic individual 
precision advice to people how to live their lives such that uh, they they are in a, in a green zone if you if you want to, to say so maybe a third company that uh, we're currently invested in is a, a company in germany that is uh, digitizing home care um they're um basically just reinventing everything around home care of either elderly people or sick people and that certainly also is in our view part of longevity very good yeah we, we would agree with that michael i mean we would consider that um aging in place is a continuation of the longevity agenda um and and likewise we would agree also that cancer is one of those areas that needs to be treated as a uh as an outrider as an outlier according to where you define longevity but let's talk a little bit about some of the areas of longevity that you find uh perhaps interesting and, and perhaps the deals that you're looking for a lot of people are very focused as we know on uh rejuvenation that's a very big subject in the area of longevity at the moment but what else are you looking for yeah along our hypothesis that I've mentioned or doctrine that I've mentioned earlier uh, ago with Red Alpine, basically wherever you have a convergence of data, uh, information with life science, that is uh, an area that we believe is super interesting, especially if that data or information is based on a longitudinal basis. Um, if you add the right computing power there and the right uh, maybe artificial intelligence, then you can empower the individual user or consumer or whatever you want to call this person um, to take action uh, in their lives. So basically everything connected with that, I mean, you have a diagnostics component, you have a computing component, you have a data component, um, and then eventually also probably... Uh, you need a, a front end piece to interact with the person. Um, that is what we believe is uh, super interesting and uh, which to a large extent is still lacking. And, and what about the uh, the wider investment community, perhaps organizations that you perhaps would be syndicating with in deals? Do you feel the wider investment community has a positive view on longevity now? Or is it changing? Hmm. Uh, that is kind of ambivalent. Uh, yes, of course, it has received a lot of coverage uh, recently. Probably longevity is still waiting for the Netflix moment. You know, like uh, when when you have this documentary, like uh, for the you know the game changer uh, or the the how to change your mind um, for the for mental disease applications. But it's becoming more popular. It's uh, becoming more positively annotated, but certainly also a couple of ethical questions get raised. Um, and I guess uh, it is about, uh, for, I, I would say the longevity community should probably take control of the discourse around these ethical questions and address them seriously and, and in, a, in a meaningful way. And then um, you can hopefully steer the whole field of longevity into a, a positively uh, recognized or annotated field. There, there is a downside of um, uh, people basically getting alienated by, uh, you know, rich people in the Silicon Valley trying to extend their life for, uh, and, and if this kind of a uh impression you know gets uh, the narrative is is is, is the way it, it gets hold in 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 the in the public then that's bad and so therefore it's probably important to create a narrative around the positive message very good michael and would you say that that is the uh, the biggest uh, challenge for the longevity sector or do you feel that there are others such as for example aging being recognized as, as disease by the fda and so on i mean any other thoughts about that yeah, there are a, a number. We, we have been thinking about that quite a bit. And I believe if, if you try to summarize that according to the definition that I have shared with you before, um, it is, uh, I would say, selling medical treatments to healthy people. Um, there you have to question who pays for that, uh, how much can you pay for that, who regulates it. Um, that, in, in my opinion, are very 
um, important challenges. Uh, there is another challenge with, which is inherently with science itself. It's a very long shot. We are at the very beginning of the whole field. And I would expect that there are going to be a lot of ups and downs uh, following maybe a Gartner hype cycle curve um, that may also have a deep impact of how much money is going to flow into the field. Um, so, so that's another challenge. Uh, I guess also it needs to be clear that there is no miracle cure out there, that it's going to be a very long journey. And that uh, if we want to do that in a, in a scientific way, there are clinical trials going to be required. And that again is very difficult because we approach the clinical trials situation with an old paradigm. The old paradigm is we are developing drugs for sick people. And the new paradigm needs to be we're developing treatments, drugs, whatever you want to call that, for healthy people. And uh, the tools we probably have in place may not fit with uh, that uh, paradigm. Yeah. And what about the, the hype cycle? Would you say that we're you know, halfway towards the peak or just in the foothills at this stage? Uh, halfway up in, in the second half, I would say we are, we are we're getting close to the peak. Okay, well, that's not, not close. I mean, th that's super important, super difficult to, to forecast. But I, you know, just from my gut feeling, I believe we are in the second half of the incline. Understood. Well, I think that's probably a, an interesting um, segue to start talking about Red Alpine and uh, the investments that you are making. I mean, what 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 can we hear from you guys over the next twelve months as to the investments that you're considering or the the, the investment types that you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, staying true to our investment uh, strategy, um, it's going to be at the intersection of tech and life science. We like database cases. We like also direct to consumer cases. Um, occasionally, also something which is very deeply, um, yeah, in, on the medical side. Um, but when it's purely about developing drugs, that is something we shy away from. We like platform technologies. Um, but again, I believe that the combination of of data and then a personalized um, recommendation for somebody to do take a, a life-changing action that is most powerful where we believe and, and it has to be it has to be fun you know uh, or at least not being perceived as a medical treatment I guess that's interesting so you're sort of moving away from therapeutics and more into supporting people with lifestyle and and likewise their own interventions and as there are a lot of interesting companies working in that space at the moment i mean can you share are there any uh, deals you're specifically looking at at the moment or is that still confidential yeah that's quite confidential obviously okay um, it's worth, worth um, asking well, though right <laughs> yes <laughs> well, we tried to to cover the field and uh, we just recently have finished a an entire deep dive on the, the industry. And uh, so we have defined a couple of sweet spots where we believe that uh, it would be interesting for Red Alpine to engage deeper. Very good. Well, uh, Michael, very much looking forward to meeting you in Berlin. And thanks very much for your time today. And uh, it's been fascinating insights into the minds of a uh, European ca venture capitalist. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to the, the meeting in Berlin.